We are at Judges 10 today, and um, we've been going pretty fast through the book of Judges. We have gone about two chapters a week, give or take, uh, over the past few weeks, and maybe uh, you've started to notice a pattern here of, of the way that the judges are ruling, and so today we, we have a map that's back and we have the timeline that's back. So, you know, uh, I love you guys, and I figured, uh, you know, I, you missed it, so uh, I thought I would I'd bring them back. So. <clears throat> Just to kind of level set where we're at in the period of history, I think it's really important. <clears throat> where are we at? Well, this timeline doesn't come to the present day even. It only goes up to the time of the birth of Christ. So it goes from about 2000 BC, which is roughly the time of the patriarchs. And what are the patriarchs? <clears throat> Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the, uh, the fathers of the nation of Israel. All the way back here about, oh, second you know, millennium, give or take. <clears throat> and it goes all the way to the time of Christ, which is right around 1 BC. In the middle is where the judges take place. And again, no one's really exactly sure when all of this happens. Um, we have, the Bible is kind of interesting because of course, when the Bible was written, especially in the Old Testament, there was no Roman calendar. There was no Christian calendar. <clears throat> we didn't have BC and AD. Um, so the Bible, tends to, to frame the timelines of when things are occurring by coordinating them with current events. <clears throat> so what the authors of the Bible will do is, um, in, the, in the time when Augustus was emperor of Rome, that's what they'll do. So they'll say, okay, well, when you know, Quirinius was governor of a certain region. Um, when certain rulers were ruling, that's how they kind of frame the timeline to kind of set it as to when all of these events were happening because they, you know, um, everyone had their own calendar at the time, essentially, and so it would be kind of hopeless to try and say, well, it's, it's the year 2000. Well, the year 2000 for the Hebrews might be the year 3000 for the Mesopotamians, the year 1000 for the Syrians, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> the other thing the Bible is fairly good at is blocks of time. So it's relative time. So the Bible will make comments like, <clears throat> um, uh, the, the Hebrews were in Egypt for 400 and some years. Um, the the uh, Israelites, um, once they entered the land of Israel, um, were there for about 400 and some years until the time of David, right? And then <clears throat> once the kings of Israel and Judah start to rule, um, they'll give, the authors will give very specific amounts of time for how long that they were ruling. So we have these blocks of time that seem fairly certain, but then it's kind of like, well, how do we fit them into like absolute time? Well, even the best scholars in the world are not exactly sure, exactly sure when this happened. We have a good idea of the general timeline. So I kind of subscribe to what is called the early exodus theory that <clears throat> um, there's kind of two schools of thought of when the Hebrews came out of Egypt. They either came out around 1450 BC, that's the early date theory. That fits with a lot of the chronology of the period, um, with most of the facts of the Bible, if you, if you want to call it that. <laughs> then there's supporters that say there's a late date Exodus theory, and the, and the primary people that support that are the people that feel that Ramses II was the pharaoh of the Exodus. That takes a lot of assumption, that's my opinion. I feel like that has a lot of error associated with it, and I don't believe that. I truly don't believe that Ramses II was the pharaoh of the, of the Exodus. I could be wrong. But give or take, you've got me as your teacher, so you're gonna learn what I, I think. And I'm, I'm, kind of, I'm kind of bookending the time of the judges around 1450 BC to around, around 1000 BC, about 1100 BC. So that's the period in which this kind of hashed bar here is when I'm saying the period of the judges occurred. <clears throat> Okay, one of the issues with this is that as, you know, as the book of Judges took shape, it's obvious that it was edited um, at, at different points. And during the editing process, different passages were kind of moved around. So in ancient manuscripts, if you go back and you, and, you, um, and we have um, ancient <coughs> manuscripts in different languages, from, from hundreds, even thousands of years ago, sometimes you'll find writings of the book of Judges in which the passages are moved and, and they're placed in different places. 
So it's kind of hard to tell when each one of these rulers ruled. Sometimes it'll say after so-and-so ruled, then this person ruled. Okay, well that kind of gives you a little bit of a relative frame of reference. Um, long story short is we're going to read about three judges today in which we think we're getting fairly close to knowing when they ruled, and, and we'll find out why in Judges 11 here. But suffice it to say that um, I think the point here is of the book is not absolute chronology, it's theology. What is the passage trying to say? What is the author of Judges trying to say? And what, who is the audience that he's writing it to? And what are they taking from it? So let's start today. I think we're gonna just jump right into the word, and we're gonna start with Judges 10. <clears throat> And it's kind of unfair. <laughs> uh, Judges 10 is very short and Judges 11 is fairly long. So um, uh, who would like to read? We're just going to do the first one here. Judges 10. We're going to go 1 through 18. Who would like to read that for me? After Abimelech died, Tola son of Pua, son of Dodo, was the next person to rescue Israel. He was from the tribe of Issachar, but lived in the town of Shamer in the hill country of Ephraim. He judged Israel for 23 years. When he died, he was buried in Shamer. After Tola died, Jer from Gilead judged Israel for 22 years. His 30 sons rode around on 30 donkeys, and they owned 30 towns in the land of Gilead, which are still called the towns of Jer. When Jer died, he was buried in Camon. Again, the Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight. They served the images of Baal and Ashtaroth and the gods of Aram and Sidon and Moab and Ammon and Philistia. They abandoned the Lord and no longer served him at all. So the Lord burned with anger against Israel and he turned them over to the Philistines and the Ammonites who began to oppress them that year. For 18 years they oppressed all the Israelites east of the Jordan River in the land of the Amorites, that is Gilead, the Ammonites also crossed to the west side of the Jordan and attacked Judah, Benjamin, and Ephraim. The Israelites were in great distress. Finally, they cried out to the Lord for help, saying, We have sinned against you because we have abandoned you as our God and have served the images of Baal. The Lord replied, Did I not rescue you from the Egyptians, the Amorites, the Ammonites, and the Philistines, the Sidonians, the Amalekites, and the Maonites? When they oppressed you, you cried out to me for help, and I rescued you. Yet you have abandoned me and served other gods, so I will not rescue you anymore. Go and cry out to the gods you have chosen. Let them rescue you in your hour of distress. But the Israelites pleaded with the Lord and said, We have sinned. Punish us as you see fit. Only rescue us today from our enemies. Then the Israelites put aside their foreign gods and served the Lord, and he was grieved by their misery. At that time, the armies of, the, of Ammon had gathered for war and were camped in Gilead, and the people of Israel assembled and camped at Mizpah. The leaders of Gilead said to each other, Whoever attacks the Ammonites first will become ruler over all the people of Gilead. Thank you. This is a very interesting passage. What are your thoughts about this? <coughs> Reactions? <coughs> Daniel? God helped them, but when did he help them? They put away their gods. Ah, okay. Their so, mm -hmm. yep. And when did they put away their gods? Well, it's after repentance. Yes. And the repentance came after what? This is the first time that God actually does it. Before they cried out and God mm -hmm. heard their cries and helped, mm -hmm. but this time he was showing that he's getting tired of helping. Yeah. <laughs> he's getting tired of helping, but I think it's deeper than that. I think it's deeper than that because <clears throat> what does it say here? It says, the Lord became angry with them, so he sold them into the hands of their enemies, essentially, who, who that year shattered and crushed them. For 18 years they oppressed them. Now here's the problem. The Israelites cried out to the Lord, we have sinned against you, forsaking our God and serving the Baals. But what do they not say there? They've said, they've just said that they've done wrong, but what is, what is conspicuously absent here? They're not going to turn away from the veils. Yes, that they're going to do something about it. What did you say? That they didn't say what they were going to do about it. Here they is, yep. they the <clears throat> oh. So here is the steps to, I would say, 
I would say effective repentance. <clears throat> People repent. And, and what does repent mean? Turn away. Turn away. Mm -hmm. What else? change of heart a change of heart that then leads to what change of action. action so it's it's look how many people have we seen in the news get caught in a scandal and come out the very next day and say I am very sorry that this happened <laughs> well of course you're sorry that this happened <laughs> I'm sorry if I offended anyone but I'm sorry if you <coughs> were upset by what I said sorry I got caught I'm sorry I got caught well I bet you're Biscuits, you are sorry you got caught. What gets me is I take, I take responsibility for it. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> That's not. And what is God saying? Because I think that is exactly what happened here. I think that is exactly what happened. God's like, you're caught. Mm -hmm. Every time I look into an Israelite home, I see a Ashtoreth idol. I see a Baal idol. I see you going off to sacrifice your children to Molech and Shemosh. Now I'm going to let you be oppressed. And the people go, ah, it sucks. Well, of course it sucks. <laughs> of course it sucks. But this is, this is the point. They repent. They accept, you know, <clears throat> accept wrongdoing. But I think what is happening here is God is saying, I need more than just words. I need more than just, you're sorry it's happening. I know you're sorry it's happening. Now what? And, and the people saying we are going to turn from our idols is conspicuously absent right before God actually speaks to them. <clears throat> and God speaks. He replies. When all of these people came and oppressed you and cried out to me for help, I did not save you from, didn't I save you from their hands? In the past, when your ancestors cried out for me, didn't I, didn't I save them? But you have forsaken me and served other gods. So I will no longer save you. Go and cry out to the gods you have chosen. Let them save you when you are in trouble. Ouch. Yeah. Ouch. How many parallels can we see from this in our own lives and in, in the time today? And, and, you know, maybe our gods aren't bail, but yep. it could be the internet. It could be, you know, money, especially. <coughs> mm -hmm. Things are super, yep. and we don't necessarily, I say we as in society, not we as in people in this room, um, but oh, it's you know, us too. we turn from God so quickly when things are on our, you know, we can make it on our own, and things are going well, and then, then things turn bad, and it's like, oh, wait a second, the internet can't help me now, the, yeah. my money can't heal me now, God, will you help me? Instead of the other way around, you maybe well, start there. That doesn't want to be one God in your life. <coughs> ah. He doesn't want to be the God you turn to for when you really need power. Mm -hmm. You want to go to the other gods when you need smaller things. Mm -hmm. Very good. So I think the, the here's the two pieces. The people repent. You have to be sorry for what you did, but you have to actually change your actions. This has to result in action. God is saying here, I don't want your empty words. You can be sorry all day long, but I want to see action, you know. <clears throat> He's just saying actions speak louder than words. Yep, I think that's still true. Well, I think, like, I think it was implied mm -hmm. before that it was obvious that you know, their other gods couldn't save them, mm -hmm. so they had to reach out to God. But in, in this one, God is actually saying it to them mm -hmm. to make it very clear, like, you know, those other gods can't save you, mm -hmm. but you think they can, so, you know, cry out to them, yeah. you know. Because before I think it was word, I mean, mm -hmm. they should have figured that out on their own. <laughs> Beans. <clears throat> you repent, you change your ways, God intervenes. Um, I think it's pretty straightforward here. <clears throat> what other what other comments do you guys have about this passage, if at all? <clears throat> okay.
Okay, let's get in. Yep, go ahead. Just that I it's making me think about, <coughs> I think it's in Kings, you know, towards the end of the, the kingdoms, and I don't know if it's Babylon or Assyria is coming, and, you know, they start worshiping like the gods that just got conquered by the, the Babylonians and things, and God's like, um, they, you know, those gods couldn't save them mm -hmm. from Assyria or Babylon. Why do you think that now they can save you? You know, I'm right here. Like, mm -hmm. I'm kind of all go home to whatever makes us comfortable, I think, sometimes. So, okay. I think Let's the, the <coughs> passage, we have sinned due to us whatever seems good to you. Ah. You know? Mm -hmm. Punish me, please, yep. for what I've done. You know, is that a... Ah. <laughs> right, right. It's, you know, it's, I mean... <coughs> <clears throat> but I don't think it's, a, you know, I think it's consequences. It sounds like. It's like, okay, we accept it. I'll accept my, my fate. It's, it's kind of like, it's kind of like the battle that will, if you punish me, then that'll pay for my sin. <coughs> that'll, mm. that'll cover it. Okay. Sounds like a willful submission. Okay. What do you mean? Like <clears throat> we're volunteering to come back under his mm -hmm. cover. Mm -hmm. You know? I know I'm indebted to you. Okay. You've got to make it right, but I'm, I'm here. Yeah, I don't think we can find that sentence from the next line, which says, only please deliver us in space. So mm -hmm. when, they, when they have that, you know, do what seems good to you mm -hmm. in mind, it, it has to include some element of not ultimate destruction and mm -hmm. punishment because they also want Deliverance. It's like there's a little bit of understanding there that he's not really just a punitive God. Mm -hmm. Like he just wants to this please is it. This is it. all the time. He's, he really wants to deliver us. Mm -hmm. He wants to bring us into, back into relationship, back into. I think I kind of have this tendency, like, you know, raising kids, if they do something wrong. <coughs> They deserve some sort of punishment mm -hmm. for that. It's a consequence. <clears throat> it's hard to, it's hard for me anyway as a parent to punish them if I haven't given them, mm -hmm. this is what's going to happen mm -hmm. if you do this. Mm -hmm. Then all of a sudden, I'm, they're like, oh my gosh, I didn't expect that to happen. Mm -hmm. You know, this punishment that, that happens. And I, don't, I think that's more how God treats us is mm -hmm. that he's, he says, if you don't do these things, this is what's going to happen. Yep. And then he just, mm. I mean, basically it says, he, he says, hey, I can't, I'm not going to deliver you anymore. So just, if that's the way you choose, then go mm. have fun with that. This is interesting. <clears throat> so God is not punitive. Meaning, he's just waiting for you to slip up to destroy you. I would, I would offer that virtually all world religions worship punitive gods. You do exactly what you're told to do, or I'm going to destroy you, and there's no mercy. <clears throat> Christianity really is almost alone in saying we believe in a God who is not punitive, who is, ba who is, who is thinking about you to make you the best person you can possibly be and to get you to that place through patience, through mercy, through intervention. God is not punitive. Um, <clears throat> I think he does. He cares about us. Um, most world religions, their, their gods don't give a rip about you. You are actually annoying them. The fact that you exist, which is kind of their fault to begin with, now they regret. You can serve and supplicate them. But in the end, most world gods, world pagan gods, are there to, you know, do whatever they want with the universe, and you're just kind of in the way. And, and if you can appease them or, or propitiate them, maybe you won't be destroyed. And maybe you'll get some kind of you know, worldly material benefit out of doing it. Um, you know, <clears throat> the, the religions, and I, and I kind of shy away against naming specific religions, but um, you know, name a volcano god in a Polyponesian uh, land in which you sacrifice um, food, um, animals, 
um, living things into it to, to make it so the volcano god won't destroy you and maybe um, your crops will grow and you will have children, right? This, that's what most world religions are about. That is not our god. Our god doesn't expect us to go up and throw things into a volcano and then maybe, just maybe, he'll be nice to us. That's not how it works. And he's not out to, to give us a list. And this is probably a misconception amongst most people who are not Christian. Well, look at all these rules you've got in your book. It's just there to make your life miserable. <clears throat> God sets out rules with clear consequences for our benefit. And it's kind of like saying, when I don't follow those rules, which are clear, and folks, read your Bibles because they're in there, how can I live my life in a godly way that will, that will bear fruit for me in the long run? There's all kinds of, don't murder, don't lie, don't cheat, don't steal, et cetera, et cetera. But if you do, guess what? You might get bitten by your own actions. <clears throat> well, it's funny because like, you know, in the different laws, mm -hmm. now we can understand some of them better. Mm -hmm. Like, maybe at the time they were like, why can't I eat pork? That's uh -huh. it, you know, it's delicious. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. I don't understand. But like, now through science, we can find that like God is protecting them because right. they couldn't have all these diseases through uncooked pork. This is exactly it. And, you know, maybe back then they were like, I don't understand why this rule exists. Or like, mm -hmm. why do I have to go outside the, the cleanliness rules, right? But he tried to save them from diseases. And That's exactly things. it. Things and mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sure there's rules that now we don't understand, but mm -hmm. they are for our benefit. We right. Just don't under might not understand why. Yep. Yeah, if we could only fast forward, you know, 200 or 500 years from now, if we're all still here, <coughs> or if the world still exists, <laughs> we're not here. <laughs> <laughs> the world still exists, you know, and Jesus hasn't come, but you know, and look back at what we're doing today, and uh, like be like. Why didn't we see that mm -hmm. <laughs> in what we're doing? Yeah. It's like it's like innate in us that we know that blood has to be shed mm. on our behalf mm -hmm. to atone for what for a wrong. Okay. And so there's something sick, wrong, whatever in us that says, "Okay, punish me for mm -hmm. that. Let me let me bear that." <clears throat> yep. So, you know. I mean, I want I, I really want to just atone. For my own stuff, I would love to be mm -hmm. able to just redeem myself. Okay, but I can't. And and how many of us try? Well, all the time. And and this is, I think, I think this is, you know, the God-shaped void. This thing that that C.S. Lewis talks about. Again, I quote C.S. Lewis quite a bit. He is not an apostle, although he is a great thinker, and I do believe a lot of what he says is, is true. And this idea that we have a God-shaped void in our head, that we have a piece that's missing, we uh, ninety-five percent of us know right from wrong. I think what you're onto is right. This idea that we all have this concept of justice. I want justice. Now, what we see as justice might be different from person to person, but I think we all want justice and we understand that when people do wrong, there is a price to be paid. And I think that's maybe not what you're getting at, but yeah. what I would see, okay. <clears throat> you know, there's, there's blood to be shed, that's, that's both literal and, and figurative, that there's a price to be paid for our wrongdoing. Now, I think what God is getting at here and this is a really good setup for chapter 11, is here's your rules. I've given them to you. In your heart of hearts and your brain, you know right from wrong. <clears throat> if you live according to these rules, what do you have to do? <clears throat> I want you to pray. I want you to know scripture. I want you to learn from others. And in this case, I would say Christians. <clears throat> okay? And I want you to follow God's commands. <clears throat> if you do these things, and, 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 I'll, and I'll add to the end here the repent piece. <laughs> repent when necessary. That's all you've got to do. It's real simple, folks. There, it's not, you know, there's 48 different kinds of practices you need to follow to get into heaven. It's not that at all. Um, it's not every day of the year is a new festival. I have to go and worship a certain God or do a certain ritual in order to, to appease God. Stay connected with God, know his truth, know his rules, and follow them. That's all you've got to do. That's really important setup for chapter 11. And love covers that. We're going to let God follow our own mind. 
And we do yep. that. We're not likely to do that. I think that's true. I think that's true. Okay. Let's read chapter 11. It's a little bit long, but it's a good one. Uh, it's 1 through 40. Jephthah was a strong soldier from Gilead. His father was named Gilead, and his mother was a prostitute. Gilead's wife had several sons. When they grew up, they forced... Je- I already forgot. Jephthah? <laughs> Jephthah, sorry. Jephthah to leave his home. CJ, I don't know. Okay. Jephthah, to leave his home, saying to him, You will not get any of our father's property, because you are the son of another woman. So Jephthah ran away from his brothers and lived in the land of Tob. There were some worthless men began... Oh, there, some worthless men began to follow him. After a time, the Ammonites fought against Israel. When the Ammonites made war against Israel, the older leaders of Gilead went to Jephthah and to bring him back from Tob. They said to him, Come and lead our army so we can fight the Ammonites. But Jephthah said to them, Didn't you hate me? You forced me to leave my father's house. Why are you coming to me now that you are in trouble? The older leaders of Gilead said to Jephthah, It is because of those troubles that we come to you now. Please come with us and fight against the Ammonites. You will be the ruler over everyone who lives in Gilead. Then Jephthah answered, If you take me back to Gilead to fight the Ammonites and the Lord helps me win, I will be your ruler. The older leaders of Gilead said to him, The Lord is listening to everything we are saying. We promise to do all that you tell us to do. So Jephthah went with the older leaders of Gilead, and the people made him their leader and commander of their army. And Jephthah repeated all of his words in front of the Lord at Mizpah. Jephthah sent messengers to the king of the Ammonites, saying, What have you got against Israel? Why have you come to attack our land? The king of the Ammonites answered the messengers of Jephthah, We are fighting Israel because you took our land when you came up from Egypt. You took our land from the Arnon River to the Jabbok River to the Jordan River. Now give us our land back to us peacefully. Jephthah sent the messengers to the Ammonite king again. They said, this is what Jephthah says. Israel did not take the land of the people of Moab or Ammon. When the Israelites came out of Egypt, they went into the desert of the Red Sea and then to Kadesh. Israel sent messengers to the king of Edom saying, let the people of Israel go across your land. But the king of Edom refused. We sent the same message to the king of Moab, but he also refused. So the Israelites stayed at Kadesh. Then the Israelites went into the desert around the borders of the lands of Edom and Moab. Israel went east of the land of Moab and camped on the other side of the Arnon River, the border of Moab. They did not cross it to go into the land of Moab. Israel sent messengers to Sihon, king of the Amorites, king of the city of Heshbon, asking, Let the people of Israel pass through your land to go to our land. But Sihon did not trust the Israelites to cross his land. So he gathered all of his people and camped at Jahaz and fought with Israel. But the Lord, the God of Israel, handed Sihon and his his army over to Israel. All the land of the Amorites became property of Israel. So Israel took the land of the Ammonites from the Arnon River to the Jabbok River, from the desert to the Jordan River. It was the Lord the God of Israel who forced out the Amorites ahead of the people of Israel. So do you think you can make them leave? Take the land that your God Chemosh has given you. We will live in the land that the Lord our God has given us. Are you any better than Balak, son of Zippor, king of Moab? Did he ever quarrel or fight with the people of Israel? For 300 years, the Israelites have lived in Heshbon and Er Eror and the towns around them and in all the cities along the Arnon River. Why have you not taken these cities back in all that time? I have not sinned against you, but you are sinning against me by making war on me. May the Lord, the judge, decide whether the Israelites or the Ammonites are right. But the king of the Ammonites ignored this message from Jephthah. Then the spirit of the Lord entered Jephthah. Jephthah passed through Gilead and Manasseh and the city of Mizpah and Gilead to the land of the Ammonites. Jephthah made a promise to the Lord saying, if you will hand over the Ammonites to me, I will give you as a burnt offering The first thing that comes out of my house to meet me when I return from the victory, it will be the Lord's. Then Jephthah went over to fight the Ammonites, and the Lord handed them over to him. In a great defeat, Jephthah struck them down from the city of Aror to the area of Minith, and twenty cities as far as the city of Abel, Karamim. So the Ammonites were defeated by the Israelites. Then Jephthah returned to his home in Mizpah. His daughter was the first one to come out to meet him, playing a tambourine and dancing. She was his only child. He had no other sons or daughters. 
When Jephthah saw his daughter, he tore his clothes to show his sorrow. He said, My daughter, you have made me so sad because I made a promise to the Lord and I cannot break it. Then his daughter said, Father, you made a promise to the Lord, so do to me just what you promised because the Lord helped you defeat your enemies, the Ammonites. She also said, But let me do this one thing. Let me be alone for two months to go to the mountains. Since I will never marry, let me and my friends go and cry together. Jephthah said, Go. So he sent her away for two months. She and her friends stayed in the mountains and cried for her because she would never marry. After two months, she returned to her father, and Jephthah did to her what he had promised. Jephthah's daughter never had a husband. From this came a custom in Israel that every year the young women of Israel would go out for four days to remember the daughter of Jephthah from Gilead. Thoughts? Is this an SMH moment? Shake my head. Yeah, weird. Mine, mine refers to her virginity, not about Mary. Yep. Yep. She wept because of her virginity. Yep. <coughs> virginity. Yep. <coughs> Which for a woman was pretty much the same thing. Yep. And very important to the culture. A woman's virginity was super important to a family, to the tribe, to the culture, <clears throat> and to her, of course. You know, Jephthah made this vow. <laughs> yeah. God didn't ask him to do this. This is it. You know, he went outside his lane, and I'm sure he thought, even then, I, I'm catching myself saying this, yeah. because, you know, I'm sure he thought he was doing the right thing, but at the same time, what the heck did he think was going to come out of his house, a dog? <laughs> Thank you. I mean, it's going <laughs> to be you. a person. So, and people didn't have pets in this era. So and right he didn't then have and there, kids. yeah, he's doing something wrong. He's vowing to do something wrong. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Life comes out, not the second one. The only I'm going to tell you the Brian Freeman cynical response. Maybe if there was some guy at home that shouldn't have been there when he was out fighting, yeah. is the only like logical thing I can think. And when that dude comes running out when I show up, maybe I'll kill him. That's it. Look, right? It makes me sleep better. It's still self-serving. Exactly. And assuming. <clears throat> exactly. <laughs> See how I make myself. Better off not to vow something than not fulfill it. Yes. I mean, it's better to not vow. Mm -hmm. Maybe yeah. honest, if you vow something, you better fulfill it. So let's let's talk about that. Lorna, because that's exactly right. Leviticus 5 tells us very specifically not to do this. Leviticus 5, 4 to 6, who can read that short passage for me? I've got it. Okay. Um, let me just. Okay. Sorry. Or if a person swears thoughtlessly with his lips to be, do evil or to do good, in whatever matter a man may speak thoughtlessly with an oath, and it is hidden from him, and then he comes to know it, he will be guilty in one of these. So it shall be, when he becomes guilty in one of these, that he shall confess that in which he has sinned, he shall also bring his guilt offering to the Lord for his sin which he has committed, a female from the flock, a lamb or a goat, as a sin offering, so that so the priest shall make atonement on his behalf for his sin. Moses was super clear about this. Don't swear. Don't swear. Why? It gets at what we just talked about here. I've already told you what you need to do. You don't have to do anything else. Pray, follow my commandments, be righteous, repent when you do wrong, and I'll be with you. But the catch here is, I want you to do what I want you to do. This opens up a whole can of worms, folks. <clears throat> If I can just win the lottery, God, I swear I will give you 50%. That's a sin. You, you can't bargain with God, folks. This is exactly what Jephthah was doing. He didn't even need to. What did he need to do? He needed to seek God's counsel. When I say pray, <clears throat> I'm going to say here, seek God's counsel. But it's interesting he made this promise after the Spirit of the Lord entered him. Yes. So in this case, he already had the Spirit. The Spirit was already with him. Um, <clears throat> you know, think back to Gideon. When Gideon had been told, remember the whole path of Gideon. Um, 
God brought him up patiently. He was, he was training Gideon's faith. Believe in me. And, and Gideon was respectful and said, I just need to understand you. And is this really coming from you or not? And we have the fleece. Um, and we have the burning up of the offering. And God eventually proved to Gideon that he could be trusted, that God could be trusted. <clears throat> when Gideon finally went with his 300 men into the Midianite camp, with a trumpet in the one hand and a torch in the other, Gideon didn't stop at the edge of the camp and go, okay, God, if you just give them into my hands, I swear, right, I'll give all of their possessions over to you, right? He didn't do that. And he did some other awful things, don't get me wrong here, but he didn't stop right at the end once God had told him what to do and make some kind of stupid vow. That's exactly what Jephthah has done here. And to, to Steve's point, we don't see evidence here that any of this was really commissioned by God. This idea that he was, he was commissioned to rule. It's really not, I don't see in the text here that God commissioned him to rule. It seems like the people are trying to get him to rule here. The people. Look, democracy is not God's way, necessarily. Just because the people want you to do something, peer pressure, right? Doesn't mean it's a good thing to do. <clears throat> we see no evidence here that God was, was behind it, much of this. <clears throat> He surrounded himself with worthless fellows. What's that going to get you into trouble with, huh? Self <laughs> with. How important is it to surround yourself with other believers? How important is it that we surround ourselves with other Christians and other believers? Other people that aren't Christians can lead us astray or try to. That's the whole pickle analogy. If you stick a cucumber in acetic acid and flavorings, it becomes a pickle, right? You become what you are saturated in. If you surround yourself with worthless fellows who don't care a rip about God, your mind, your actions, your thoughts, even though you may not see this happening, are going to start to change. You are going to start to take on the characteristics of that which you are immersed in. So he surrounds himself with worthless fellows. He doesn't seem to be <clears throat> not seeking God's counsel fully. <clears throat> he seems to kind of be bargaining with God. He's, you know, <clears throat> he's bargaining with God. That's the, that's the only way to say it. He still wants to have his part in it. Though. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. But he wants it his way. He wants it his way. Goodness gracious, folks, how many times does God, you know, I want this for me and I want to do it in the following way. I want to go A, B, C, and D. I'm going to follow you, God, and what you told me to do. But here's how. Yes. Yes. I saw a, so, you know, a few years ago, maybe it's still a thing, the whole craze about home <laughs> renovation um, TV shows for people who are poor or destitute or, or down on their luck. And the TV company and, and a construction company would come in and through benevolence, of course, benevolence because they want ratings, <clears throat> um, would build houses for people. And I saw an episode once where they had gone in to, this, to these people who were very poor. And they had, of course, there's always a story, you know, um, the husband had died, um, the, the mom was out of work, et cetera, et cetera. They're going to get kicked out of their house. The company comes in, they, they, they buy the house, and they refurbish it. They show up on day one to refurbish it, and the family has laid out plans for how they want the company to build their house. <laughs> and the builder comes in and he goes, and he literally looks at it and he goes, are you kidding me? <laughs> how do you think God feels when he has come into your life to fix what you have messed up? Make no mistake, what you have messed up. And he's like, I'll do this for you. I am benevolent, I am not punitive, and I care about you, but this is how things are gonna go. And you say, no, 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 here, I'm gonna leave some instructions for you. If you could just, you know, give us a, a, you know, a library wing and a, and a pool in the back and a three-story, that would be great. <laughs> how do you think he feels? And if you could just do this for me, if you could just give me the pool in the backyard, oh, I swear, I'll have a pool party for my church friends every Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> Swimming for Jesus. <laughs> Maybe that'll be the title of this video. I like that. That's good. What's the problem with all this? 
Well, the motives. Motives. Okay. I heard a whole bunch of good ones. Motive. What else? It's all about me, not God. What did you say, Lorna? No appreciation. No appreciation. This is exactly it. Not only have I done all of the wrong here, but I'm not even thankful that God is even bothering to help me. What did God do for the universe? He made it. He created it. What did he do for you? He made you. He gave you everything that you have. But if I can just leave the plans for the three-story house with the pool and the, and the four-car attached garage, it'd be great if you could do that, God. Not, not only do I want my outcome, mm -hmm. but I want my process, too. Yes. I want you to do it this way. Hmm? He's telling God how to be merciful. I don't know about you, being the limited uh, <clears throat> free will creature that I am, if someone told me how to be merciful, oh, I'd be so mad. So what does Jeff the get out of this? So I want to be clear here. <clears throat> Did Jeff the win? Yep. He won. Guess what? He won. <clears throat> so I think this gets at the merciful piece of our God. Now, it could go one of two ways. If I was God of the universe, I probably would have been like, bye-bye, <clears throat> Jeff, <clears throat> right? <clears throat> You're out of here. God didn't do that. What did God do? He said you can be a daughterless judge. That's what you want. Yeah. So we let him, he let him win, but what was the consequence here? The daughters. <clears throat> he suffered, and how did he suffer? But in his way. He got what exactly what he asked for. Oh, goodness gracious, folks. It's kind of one of those things. Be careful what you ask for, because you just might get it. He got exactly what he asked for. So here, <laughs> you know, it's, a, it's the old thing. Some people pray to say, God, I want you to heal my mom of cancer. But if you don't, that's okay. Your will be done. Now, there is some merit in that. There is some merit in saying, however you do what you want to do, you, you are God of the universe. Um, they may not even say cure her of cancer. They may just say, God, please intervene in my, in my mom's life. It's tension here between being specific about what you do want, but not crossing that line with making any kind of stupid vow about what you'll do and how to get there. The, 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 I think the righteous way is, please, God, cure my mom of cancer. I want you to cure her of cancer. And I want you, my mom doesn't have cancer, by the way. I just, it's an analogy. I want you to cure my mom of cancer. And please don't let her suffer. And please, whatever happens, I want you to be glorified through it. That is a righteous prayer. The sinful prayer is, I want you to cure her of cancer. I want it done tonight. <clears throat> I want, um, I want uh, you know, you to do uh, in the following ways. I want to be able to take three weeks off. I want my kids to be able to you know, quit school and now she wins some kind of lawsuit and we can all go to private school. And I want to be able to sue the doctor because he was kind of initially wrong about the diagnosis so that we can pay off our house and I can go to Fiji. No, 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 no. The, the point of why we even talk to God in the first place is that he is glorified. Folks, you exist to glorify God. That's, that's why you are here. And that you can be righteous, mature Christians. Anything else is, is beyond what God has planned for you in your life. Focus on the righteousness. Don't make stupid vows. What are your thoughts there? I wonder what prevented him from just not following through with his vow. Yeah, okay. I mean, he was already sinning. You know what I mean? Like, <clears throat> I don't know. Like, why can't he stand on this one thing? Would you think that, I don't know. I'm sure vows were different, like, Nowadays, mm -hmm. people would have no yep. function in just saying, oh, I said that, no, I don't care, I'm not going to follow through. You know, we wouldn't care yes. at all. But I'm sure that, you know, vows were very important back then. Here is a really good point. Leviticus 5, you can read it in the way of saying, if you make a stupid vow that has a sinful reason, don't go through with it. 
If, if you, if God, if you give me that, that swimming pool in the back, I swear I'm going to burn every Muslim nation to the ground, right? Don't do it, please, right? You don't have to follow through on a stupid, sinful vow. He didn't have to do this. What does Leviticus say? Leviticus kind of gets at, if you do make this stupid vow and you sin through doing it, you need to make an atonement for it. You need to get right with God. You need to, you know, sacrifice a lamb, not your daughter. <clears throat> and get right with God, but he went through with it for whatever sense of you know, honor or whatever. Well, his daughter also said to, that he needed to follow through with it, so. And bless her heart, <laughs> right? Yeah. Bless her heart. Thank you, honey, but maybe I shouldn't do that. Maybe I shouldn't do that. It really, really speaks to his, his distrust. Yep. At, at, while he's trusting God, mm -hmm. he's still distrusting oh, God. Oh my gosh, this is so true, Ken. He still distrusts. Why? Why do you say that? Because I think I know why you're saying it. You tell he's, me. <clears throat> he, he's telling everybody. He's like, God's going to deliver me. God's, you know, if if I defeat these people, then because God said I would, then I get to be the judge. Mm -hmm. And then he goes back to God. And he's like, Okay, now I've made this promise yep. that I'm going to be the judge. And so if you would just, you know, appease me in this way, I'll. Sacrifice. Yep. You know, God doesn't want um, <clears throat> promises for the future. He wants obedience today. Yes. Yes. That is so. That is so deep. Sometimes when we pray for things, we don't know how quite how to pray. I prayed one time for one of my granddaughters as a writer. She writes stories, and the teacher had said, you know, they could be published. Mm -hmm. They were that good. And uh, she was going to have they were going to publish one, and of uh, she's out of high school and mm -hmm. going. But anyway, they were going to publish it. It's a Christian publisher, but uh, I prayed because I didn't. And then my previous minister said I don't know how to pray, and I explained to him that. And then you know the people, and if she was successful, the people she might encounter that the success might be not good for her. <coughs> Might be, you know, any. So then, you know, you don't know what to pray, and so uh, he suggested just to pray to God to take care of it, and he did. It didn't get published. Here. And it, okay. You know, that was best for, for the situation. This is exactly this is exactly the point, Lorna. Jephthah, and look, there's probably ten different righteous ways that Jephthah could have gone about this. One way is to say, God, I want to do Your will. Tell me what you want me to do, and I'll do it. And in the outcome, I will be fine with. It could be that God never wanted Jephthah to be a judge. It could have been. It could have been that God never wanted Jephthah to rule the Israelite tribes because he knew he was kind of an idiot, right? And he made stupid decisions. What if, when we pray, I pray, God, please cure my mom of cancer. I'm desperate that you don't let her suffer. But in the end, I want you to be glorified through this and other people to see the power and the glory and majesty of God. Now, it could turn out that God has a plan for us that does not include my mom being cured of cancer. In the end of the day, I need to be very specific about what I'm praying for. So don't get me wrong here. I'm not saying pray very vague prayers that have no substance whatsoever. Don't do that. Pray very specific prayers about what you're looking for. But then you have to stop and say, but... I want your will to be done. And please, if that's not your will to do what I've just asked you for, I would like you to help me to understand why. And I want you to help me understand how the alternative, whatever that's going to be, is going to glorify you. And in the end, I need to be okay with it, as hard as that's going to be. And I might not be. That, it might not be that easy. Don't you think sometimes he cares of by taking them home? I, and in that case, I would totally agree with you. And that's the thing. We are, Lorna, we are limited creatures. How much, how much perception do I have of the universe? I literally can only see what's in this room right now, right? And barely that, right? <clears throat> God sees everything. And again, I do the tapestry. I know I beat it to the ground. The universe is like a great tapestry, beautiful tapestry. If you've ever, how many people have ever seen a tapestry before? Either a picture or in, in person. <clears throat> it's a giant woven picture, okay? Woven with thread. And it makes a beautiful picture. You turn it around, and what do you get? Chaos. It's 
strands going everywhere and all this mishmash of shape and colors. And if you had laid that out for me, Brian Freeman, I'd look at it and go, I have no idea what this is, right? Which side does God see? It's a trick question. Both. both. <clears throat> he sees both. And, and the truth is he knows, he knows what the right outcome of this needs to be. But I do think and know he sees our, our side of it too. And that's why I think God is not a, he's not a punitive, uncaring God. I think he knows that if I pray for my mom to be cured of cancer and she isn't, that that's going to hurt me. I, I do. But I think I also know that if I am humble, and again, I say all of this theoretically, and when it really happens, I, I may not be this strong. Couple, couple things I've <clears throat> learned about prayer. <clears throat> one is that, and I'm not good at either one of these on a, on a consistent basis by any means, but one is if I ask him how to pray for a situation, yes. and I hear him <clears throat> tell me in a certain yep. direction of with, you know, in which to pray, then that prayer happens. It, yep. It comes true. Okay. <clears throat> and so I literally have to say, you know, so let's say today. This uh -huh. one, my girlfriend's lives in Grinnell. She has a, a big children's program this afternoon. Mm -hmm. I, I know what to pray for. Mm -hmm. the, the props are all in place and the people all show up and <clears throat> the things go smoothly and the lights mm -hmm. go right, the music yep. goes right. and. People show up and kids get a you know great message from God and I mean I know all of those things to pray. Mm -hmm. I woke up this morning and said, "How do you want me to pray for today?" This is great, Ken. Specifically, ask God, "How can I pray for her day yep. today?" And what did that imply? And this this gets at the the root of the <coughs> issue that I think ninety five percent of us have a problem with prayer. Prayer is not a one way act. Once you pray your prayer, and here's all the things that I'm thinking. And here's all the things I'd like you to help me with. Then what do you do? What should you do? Listen. Listen. Okay, now I'll listen. How many of us, and it's been really hard for me, I'll admit this, have gotten to a point in their prayer life where they pray all of these things and then they just sit there and they focus. What, it, what do I think God is telling me? Let me just listen and do it in a quiet place. Do it in a quiet place. What do I hear God saying to me? If you focus... And you ask him specific things. I think this is important. You ask him a specific thing, and then you just listen. I'm telling you, folks, maybe I'm just the odd one out here. I do feel I know what God is telling me, and I hear it pretty quickly. I don't have to wait a long time. Now, I may not like the answer I think I'm hearing. Okay? You just have to listen. And if, if it helps you, write it down. Say, this is what I just prayed. And then I waited for a minute, and I focused solely on what I think God is trying to tell me. What is the thing that is coming to my mind? What do I think I hear him saying? Write it down. Write it down. And that, <clears throat> that voice will sound mysteriously like your own voice. Yep. And the enemy will say, oh, that's just you. Yes. That's just you. Yes. It, yes. That's not really God. So beware of that, for one. Secondly, the, the other part of <clears throat> how I start praying, August of last year, <clears throat> was simply, Jesus, show me the depth of your love for me. I see. And so... And that's basically where this morning's prayer came to, from from him. Nice. I, all of a sudden, he's like, "You just pray that people see my love today." Nice. Um, I don't remember what I was watching. Something, but the guy said, "My my reli my religion is boiled down to just love. It's not about all these other things." And that's what he wants to show us. And if you want to, if you want to, you know, you want to know how to pray God's will, ask Him to show you His love. Very good. Just as simple as that. I think with that though, his hand goes knowing, knowing the Scripture, knowing yes. the character of God through Scripture. Mm -hmm. Because I've I've had students I've worked with in the past. Uh, you know, I'd be, I'd be working with them about prayer and praying to God. And, they were the ones who didn't grow up in church. They didn't know their Bible. They weren't really the whole reading mm -hmm. thing. They say, well, I think God isn't really this. Well, don't think he is, because I don't think God's saying he's okay with you sleeping with your girlfriend, honestly. <laughs> this is it. i got to listen, and this, this is Ken's point. Whatever I pray for has to correspond to what the Scripture is telling me. And it has to correspond to what other Christians would think and are telling me. Christians that you, you hold in high regard, including pastors and elders. 
Um, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Thing I found when I prayed for one of my granddaughters, and uh, I uh, asked her, asked him to get her home. Mm -hmm. And the next morning, it was in progress, but it was done in such a way she learned a lesson that she wasn't from somebody else. Mm -hmm. that happened to somebody else. She learned it. So it was the best way. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't even thought of it. You know, it's like, oh, but he does it in such a good way. He does it what's good. Good for, for her to This learn. is exactly it. God is not punitive. He's focused on the best the best for us. And the best for us doesn't mean that you're happy and you have a million dollars. It means that you are a mature Christian who worship God and you're telling others about him. And that you have a healthy, a healthy, joyous relationship with Christ. Um, let's finish up real quick here. So something that I haven't been doing a good job of lately is kind of tying back, and this is, I love this, is tying back um, the, the scriptures to history. It's really important for you guys. Not just that we're getting the theology, and almost all of this is theology today, but some of it needs to be apologetics, it needs to be archaeology, it needs to be history. So when people come to you, and the scripture says, be prepared with an answer for why you have the faith that you have in Christ. And you need to be able to respond. So <clears throat> you've got this weird name up here, Merneptah. So part of uh, what I think is important in this class is you know about the physical evidence that proves the Bible is in fact true. <clears throat> 1200 BC, a long time ago, a pharaoh of Egypt reigned named Merneptah. <clears throat> Pharaohs and almost all ancient kings often would build monuments to themselves for propaganda purposes to help to solidify their reign, to help to publish how great they were. Often they were a bit inaccurate, of course, as you might imagine. Um, there were these things called stelas which are essentially a stone pillar or monument. That was the first Twitter account that, that Pharaoh <laughs> Trump, I mean, Merneptah had to publish, look, Obama too. Look, I'm, I'm, it's both sides. Um, these were the first propaganda methods that people could use to tell the world how great they were, to keep their power. It turns out that, we can pass this around, a stela has been found in ancient Egypt that belonged to Pharaoh Merneptah, and in it, in hieroglyphics, he refers to Israel. It turns out that this is the first and earliest mention of Israel as a nation that we have in history. <clears throat> it comes from 1200 BC, and it boasts about how Merneptah was so good that he destroyed the Israelites. Israel is no more. His seed is not. It is the first mention of Israel ever in ancient history, written down somewhere. And it is the earliest reference by an Egyptian to Israel. Now, if the Pharaoh of Egypt is writing about Israel in 1200 BC, what does that tell you about Israel? They're important. They're important. They're important enough that I had it written down on this slab. What else? Maybe even more basic than that. They existed. They're real. Yeah. <laughs> they're real. And they're called, you know, and in you know, hieroglyphics, the translation essentially, they are called Israelites. <clears throat> They are in Canaan because he's talking about his conquests in what is the region we call Canaan. How awesome is this, folks? How awesome is this? Now, he is, of course, boasting about how they're wiped out. Well, they're not wiped out. Uh, we know that. <clears throat> um, but this is the kind of thing I want you guys to know about, um, that it does exist. In fact, um, in March, we are very blessed. We are going to take a trip to London. And one of the, you know, of course, uh, Laura and I both are big history nuts. We like art. Um, we're taking Violet with us. The British Museum has one of the greatest collections of biblical archaeology in the entire world. I've actually made a list of all of the artifacts, art, monuments, pottery, um, uh, papyrus, and, and writings 
that we are going to go, and I'm going to show Violet, here is this list of like three dozen things that prove the Bible is real. The people of the Bible were real, the places of the Bible were real, and the events were real. All align to what the Holy Scriptures say. So I would encourage you um, to look that kind of stuff up. It's out there. It's not just written in paper. Um, in the Gideon Bible you find in your hotel, there is actual evidence. Exists. Okay. Let that, let that evidence satisfy that need. Don't promise anything for you know, when you get home, the first thing out of your house or anything like that. What's that? I said don't, let any, don't make any promises or vows that the first thing out of your house will sacrifice. Oh, uh, well, uh, let thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> thank you. That is a very good way to end this. <laughs> Whatever comes out of my house. Ah. All right. There's something else that proves that the Bible is true, too. I don't know if you guys heard of it years ago. Um, they were trying to line up the satellite, and they couldn't get the time to work just right. They were off a little bit. And one of the guys remembered in the Bible that God moved the sun backwards. Uh, I forget now how it went. But anyway, so they added that into their calculation. Well, thanks. So next week, we are actually going to start talking about Samson. So join us, and uh, we'll go from there. Thank you.